can hear what you sound like. Hello, hello, hello. I'm starving. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Haven't even had a cup of tea. It's surprisingly fresh. I yeah, slept exercise. on that couch wow. last night. <laughs> I fell asleep on the couch. <laughs> How do I ever do that? <laughs> oh, yeah. When this film's out, I'm never talking about it again. <laughs> so, my name is Glenn. I am the writer, director, and producer of A Tale to Tell. I originally began the project, it was quite a personal thing, it was something that I felt I needed. Um, Glenn had this idea, thought it was quite cool, spoke to me and, and Lisa. We wanted, just wanted to bring Panto basically at Christmas. There's, I've got a little niece and she comes every single Christmas Eve, it's been tradition since she was one years old and we, she was just gutted that she wouldn't get to see Auntie Lisa and Panto this year so we sort of thought of an idea, Glenn is very on it with the creativity. He just felt that there needed to be something and there were so many ridiculously talented people in, in the industry out of work, just hoping, waiting for something to come their way. And once I think I asked the first two or three people and heard their response to, I really need something right now, I started realizing it isn't just me. This isn't about what my feeling, this is what the whole industry is feeling. This is the one time we all feel exactly the same and are in the exact same boat. A few months back, Glenn was on the phone. He said, I've got this mad idea for a project. I need an idiot. Are you available? And I said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. Get me on board. So here I am. Every single person that we asked said yes. Every single person. Blew my mind. Within three days, he had a full cast and we had a sort of story. And then off we went, tell to tell began. <laughs> I haven't slept a wink, so that's why I'm emotional right. Um, it's just because you love us. <laughs> yes, I love you all. Um, but yeah, let's just smash through it. It's going to be a bit of a crazy one. Please practice your stuff because we don't really have time to, if we have mistakes, to go again and stuff like that. So I want to try and get stuff as smooth as possible. The only problem we have is time. Everything else, the costumes are amazing, choreo, music, you guys, epic team, just time. So A Tale to Tell is a short film, um, kind of a reflection of what's happening in the world today. I've tried to set it in a world where um, pantomime characters are real and they're famous, they've got lots of followers online and people kind of, you know, wait and get super excited to see who's going to be in their city this year and who, who are they going to get to see tell their story on stage. But then there's two kids who are so excited to go and see Panto. Um, it's their favourite thing and they get to the theatre find out it's cancelled, it's not going ahead. And that just throws everything off kilter. And then what do they do? What do the characters do? So the characters end up in their, their normal day jobs, which are, again, a reflection of, one, their characters that we know. So we have Snow White in the Apple Store. We've got Cinderella working in a shoe shop, uh, a Sleeping Beauty in a bed shop, uh, Aladdin in a carpet shop. But also some of their jobs are a reflection of the things that kind of defeated them. So. Cook is working in a clock shop and obviously the clock is the doom that is kind of haunting him the whole time. I feel that all fairy tale characters have more to them than what people see and I think putting them into real life is the link that it needed for kids to watch it and go, oh my god I know that person but that person's going through what my dad's going through or that person's going through what my mum's going through and you now got the entertainment and the fun side of and the, and the magic and the sparkle of it but at the same time it's so apparent and it's happening. I'm playing Cinderella, <laughs> playing Snow White, um, obviously. So I'm a receptionist, for example. When I'm not on stage, I teach, so I teach dance. I've been a builder for the last uh, few months, so, um, you know, yesterday I was putting up fences and today I'm Prince Charming. So, uh, so, it's, so, yeah, it's a bit of a crazy whirlwind life, but, you know, we've got to make do with what we've got and you've got to make the best out of the situation. So that's what we're all trying to do. We've all, we've all been there and these actors have, have all been there, so it wasn't like they had to dig too far to, to find what the character might be feeling, what they might be going through. I never ever thought in my lifetime that theatre wouldn't be a thing. And also I never thought that it would be so... just kind of let go by everyone, not by everyone, but by the government. I never thought we would be sort of bottom of the pile. I think it has become quite clear for everybody that the arts, let's call it, and entertainment um, is definitely taken for granted. Um, this year shows that more than ever. Do you know what, I, I actually think people don't understand how much artistic process goes into everything. Every minor detail. It's not just 
actors, it's not just us. You know, you do a show and there's like 20 people on stage and you think that's that, but you don't look behind the scenes, there's quick change people, you know, costume, cameramen, it's lighting, it's makeup, it's directors, it's casting directors, it's not just actors. And I think that's what people are looking at as well, saying like, you know, actors are out of work, they're struggling and everything, but it's not just us, there's a whole massive load of us. things come into play but people just kind of see it as oh it's just singing and dancing isn't it that's kind of it there's, there's so many just like strings to the bow you do this for so long and then suddenly you get told by you know people that you're not viable <laughs> learn something else have a new craft and you're like uh, no I've worked really hard to do what I do as a living I've been dancing since I was three years old. But by the time I got to 12, and it was actually Panto, I watched the Panto, and I loved the girl playing Cinderella. And I said to my mum and dad, I, I want to be that girl, I want to be that girl. And literally, in the back of the programme, there was an addition for a theatre school in Glasgow. I moved away from my family. It's a really, really, really hard life. People saying, get new careers and, and just drop it, it's, it's completely insulting, really. It's completely insulting because we work our asses off. When you're a young person and you hear that, you're gonna read it 10 times worse, you know? And I think that's the scare, doing what you love to do. I carry that message, chase the dream for that purpose. Whatever it is that you love to do, try making that your dream job. And, and this is not me saying, you know, having a nine to five job isn't a dream job because for some people, a nine to five job is what they want to do. But it's having that same respect for any other, do you know what I mean? This is what we love to do, and why would I train from three to then not do it anymore? That's, that's madness, and it's rude. That's not gonna happen. <laughs> It's a bit of a shrug the shoulders, it feels like. I know okay, maybe we can't do anything about it, but the mental health aspect of this whole thing, of this pandemic, we can't even help that. And that is the one thing I think our industry does really well, is we help a lot of people just have a, can switch off and enjoy something uh, without fear, without stress. We can't even give them that. And, um, and I think that's the hardest thing for me. We need this, and I think everybody needs this. People use music, they use um, films, they use plays, they use books, everything as a, as a sort of a, a relief from something. I mean, like, even during war times, you know, theatre still went on to keep um, the morale and just that, f that good feeling within uh, just the general public. Hopefully, from this pandemic, we'll see that we are needed more than anything else, you know. We bring a lot of life and a lot of joy and a lot of smiles for people every, every day. So it's okay to be a bit street there? Yeah. <laughs> Everyone needs entertainment. Everyone needs the Netflix and the Amazons and the films to escape from the stuff that is happening. And I think as much as it may not be seen by the government that's important right now, but it's been very much seen by everyone else. I think pantomime is a kid's, usually their first introduction into theatre, and usually that's the moment that ignites the spark that could create the next Michael Jackson, or the next, the next big dancer, the next big singer, the next big performer. We want people to continue to watch theatre all the way through until their 40s, 50s, 60s, 80s, then we need panto to be good. Imagine I didn't go see the dance show that made me go to my mom after and say, I want to start dance lessons. And then that led to my whole life and my whole career. We are determined to keep it alive because people need it alive. And so if we can bring that to them in any way, I think that's our, that's our duty. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I need that at least three times. The individual characters all have their own stories, but as a whole, they have a story to tell, which is why I wanted to go with the tale to tell big part of the first chorus of this song is it says no more lights ahead of the darkest times. So they're thinking about this big kind of turmoil that they're all going through together, but in their own individual way. You take the ability to perform and act and sing out of a performer and an actor, and they are completely lost. 
singers, dancers, actors, crew, writers, every, like everybody this year has struggled majorly. Um, the love and the passion for something that you know you wake up for every single day um, is not available. I didn't realise how much I missed it until I went back in and will never take it for granted again. Look on the mic. Watch my hand, it's a spike. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone wave to behind the scenes. Every time I think about the film, it does make me feel overwhelmed. I can't even say the word overwhelmed. <laughs> The most, the most overwhelming thing for me is that everyone said yes and everyone came together, like, for each other. I've not experienced anything like this before. Everyone as part of this film have meant that it was, it's just been, it's been easy. It's been challenging, but it could have been a lot more challenging if we didn't have these people. You know, having, having someone with the skill set of Chris as a camera operator, he travels down from Birmingham pretty much every weekend. He gives up his weekends for the last six, seven weeks. Bly as well, the director of photography, is giving up his nights basically to edit this film. And Like we've had one day of rehearsals to learn the whole 12 minute number, which is un it's unrealistic. Everything we've done in this shoot has been unrealistic. The final shoot day was 16 hours long. Most people were in costume, in heels, in makeup all day had had you know, not the most nutritious of food and drink and so, you know, but everyone was just super happy. We had over 125 shots to film, which even if I gave them five minutes each, we didn't have enough time. The maths did not work and we did it, but we did it because of the people. We did it because of the people on stage, because of the people helping. Everyone in the building was there to win and everyone was there to create something special and they did that for me in this film. Like, I will never, I will never have a cast or crew this good. You can put me on a film with Will Smith and whatever, but this cast is mad. Like, and it's just like, this film wouldn't have been like this without them. I don't think, I hope they realize, but I don't think they realize how much it means to me, but I hope it means that much to them when they look back at it. Obviously we don't want to have to make a film like this in a pandemic, but I don't think we could have made this in any other time because the businesses that we went to, the carpet shop, the wedding dress shop, the shoe shop, and everyone was very happy to help because they were struggling. So they were just happy to help for nothing in return. This is going to mean a lot to a lot of people. Do you know what I mean? Whether they're watching, whether they've been involved, whatever it may be, this is going to mean a lot to so many people that have had such a strange and crazy year. You don't know what's around the corner, you don't know. We had no idea that this year was going to turn out this way. You know, you always think that these superhero characters always can already see the end and they already think they're going to win, but they don't. They always have their dips and they always have their moments. And we have the Dane to kind of end the whole thing. And um, he says at the end, just to the kids, to make sure like you can always find your happy ending. Just remember that there is hope at the end. This lockdown might be crazy. You might not have seen your friends at school at the moment, or your birthday might not have been the same this year, but it will be okay at some point. The happy ending will come. You just have to have hope. As much as it's seeing no more light ahead of the darkest times, the ending is to say, we get through that no matter what. And even though these times for us might stay for a lot longer, we don't know how long, but I'm sure at some point we'll be looking back and going, do you remember that? Because times will be better. And kids need to believe that more than anything. Dreams do come true.